and action! <laughs> Welcome along to another Filming and Fettling. This episode is all about editing and post-production. And it's aimed at people who don't have a broadcast background, but want to know the right way to go about it. I'm going to try and keep things as simple as possible. I won't be going too far in depth here, and there won't be a whole lot of technical jargon. And where there is, you'll see a brief explanation of things like acronyms and so on. The whole point is to try and bring something that is, by nature, quite technical onto a level that is easy to understand, without the technical bits getting in the way. So if you're a YouTuber or blogger, and love getting out there with a camera, but then dread the hours spent at a computer putting it all together, this could be for you. You'll probably already know a lot of what's coming, but there might be a snippet where you'll think, oh wow, didn't realize that, how cool. And if there's just one occasion where that happens, well, I'll take it. So where do we start? Well, here's the list of things I'll be covering. Organizing the footage, creating a project, editing, audio, color grading, and exporting. The idea here is to give you just enough of the basics so that you can import your footage, edit it, and pop something out the other end that's actually watchable. Now, it's highly likely that all this is going to throw up some questions, so if you want more detail, focus on the terminology I use and pop that into Google. Or... Put your questions down in the comments and I'll do my best. So let's get started. I'm assuming that you have some editing software on a computer to use. This software is called an NLE, which means non-linear editing. It stems from the transitional days between film and video. So if you hear me say NLE, you'll know what it means. You can use any software you like. They all do the same job of allowing you to import footage, manipulate it into the order of your choice, modify it, and export it as something hopefully enjoyable to watch. The most popular professional NLEs are apps like Apple's Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro, Avid Media Composer, Vegas Pro, and a couple of others. And last but by no means least, Blackmagic Design's DaVinci Resolve, which is what I'll be using. Before Final Cut Pro 10 came along, or FCPX if you like, I used to use FCP7, which I actually still do use sometimes for broadcast work because it handles some TV footage very well. If you don't have a clue what to use, anything you have access to will do. And if you don't, go download the free version of DaVinci Resolve and at least that'll get you into the ballpark. All of these NLEs can appear daunting and the instruction manuals for them can run to thousands of pages and I'm not kidding. But like anything complicated, there's always an easy way to get you going. After all, take a farm tractor. It still has an accelerator pedal, brake pedal and a steering wheel. So even though you haven't got a clue how to operate anything else in the cab, well, you can drive a car, right? Then you can drive a tractor. There's plenty of YouTube videos showing you the technical details of each NLE out there, so if you get stuck, have a look at those. And, well, if all else fails, you've got some great bedtime reading. So, before we launch into an edit, you're going to need to bring in all those amazing shots, right? You've got your footage, and you've copied it across to your computer, which, if you're really keen, has a separate hard drive to keep all your footage on. There's a few reasons for this, which can make things a bit easier, but if you don't, then don't worry too much about it. If you do get a separate drive, make sure it's at least 7200 RPM of the old-fashioned spinning type, or better yet, an SSD, which means Solid State Drive and they are very fast, perfect for video. And while you're at it, buy two. One to use as a backup. You do back up everything, right? If there's one piece of advice I'd always shout from the rooftops, it's back up everything and back up often. Now, I work on Macs, but if you're on a PC, no problem. Everything from here on applies to both. When you copy across from your media card, say you've got an SD card, you can just drag and drop, or whatever way suits you. For more complicated cards, like S by S and so on, I would use a duplication software like Shotput Pro. 
And that's only because on some of the more professional cameras, there's lots of files that need to get copied across as well as the video. And Shotput Pro copies and verifies everything, so there's less chance of corrupted files and so on. If you don't know what any of that means, don't worry. Drag and drop, baby. Try and be organized. Get those camera files into a new folder you've created just for the job. But before you start importing, maybe think about the footage you've got. Whether or not you've shot it or someone's given it to you, you kind of need to know what it is. If you've shot it yourself, then you'll know the system frequency, pixel dimensions and frame rate. In a nutshell, if you're in the USA and most of the Americas, you're in what's called NTSC territory. And if you're in Europe and most of the rest of the world, you're in PAL territory. It's all a bit of a holdover from analog TV of the past, but it's still relevant today. NTSC is generally used in areas with 60 hertz electrical frequency, and PAL is used in 50 hertz areas. If this is going right over your head, just listen and nod blankly. What it means in practice is that if you're in the USA, you shoot at 30 or 60 frames per second, and in the UK, Europe, and most other places, shoot at 25 or 50 frames per second. Now, we could have a whole video on this subject alone, and it would still grind away in Facebook groups until Judgment Day. And don't even get me started on 24, 29.97, and all those other wacky frame rates. Google is your friend. What do I shoot on? For broadcast in the UK, we shoot on 50i, which means interlaced, at 25 frames per second, but you don't need to know that. For YouTube, I shoot at 25p or 50p, which means progressive, which is basically everything that's not for broadcast on the TV. At the end of the day, you can shoot any frame rate you like. Maybe try experimenting. There's quite a few artistic and other reasons for the different rates. If you want a starting point, say for YouTube, go for 25 or 30 frames per second. Also, it depends on what you have available on your camera. If you look at the frame rates on it and say you're in the UK and you can't see 25 or 50, then maybe look at the setup menus. Set the system frequency, either PAL or NTSC, to the area you're in. If you have it set to PAL, you should see the 25 and 50 numbers and you're on the right track. Now, files that come out of cameras can be a bit of a nightmare. Some NLEs, the editing apps, remember? don't like just importing them as they come out of the camera. Some don't mind, some do. Others, it can affect their performance. You can get jittery playback, black holes, weird colors, all sorts. What all NLEs do like are QuickTime movies or MOVs. But just because your camera footage might have the three-letter extension .mov, well, guess what? It isn't necessarily a QuickTime MOV. In fact, virtually all camera footage is output from the camera as MP4 files. That's because they're compressed as a way of saving space. And that means they really need uncompressing either before the NLE or while in the NLE. The other thing to consider before importing your footage is this. Is all your footage from the same source? Did it all come from just your own camera, for instance? If so, hey, happy days. If not, let's say you've got your footage from your camera, which was shot at 50p, but you're also using footage you shot on your iPhone, which is at 30p. Then you really need to think about the frame rate of the actual edit you'll be doing. It's generally not a good idea to mix different frame rates in the same edit. So let's say that the vast majority of your footage is from your camera at 50p, and maybe a couple of minutes worth of footage from your iPhone at 30p. In this case, what you'd really need to do is convert the iPhone 30p footage to 50p. You'll be editing on what's called a timeline, and I'll go much more into that later. But that timeline will be one set frame rate, and having all your footage play happily on that timeline means making sure that any extra footage you have can be converted, either within the NLE app or beforehand. And there's lots of software capable of doing this. If you're on a Mac, I highly recommend Apple's compressor software. I just couldn't be without it. 
But for transcoding footage, and that means taking the raw camera footage and turning it into footage that the NLE likes, I use some old and free software called MPEG Stream Clip. That might not work on later operating systems, but you could try. With it, I can literally drag in a camera file and it turns it into something that the edit software gets on very well with. And it does batches as well. Takes a while, but saves a whole world of pain in the edit. In a nutshell, if you're importing your footage into your NLE and have no issues, then carry on. If you get weird stuff like playback skipping or bizarre disjointed colors or anything else, then your footage needs attention before importing into the NLE. Something else to Google. Right, you're in your NLE app, like here we have DaVinci Resolve. The first step is creating a new project. In Resolve here, it's called a project. In other NLEs, it might be called something else. You're starting an editing event, if you like, a nice clean slate to edit your footage on. But you've got to set the parameters first. You have to tell your NLE what the pixel size is and what the frame rate is. Here, my original footage is HD, which means high definition, which is 1920 by 1080 pixels. If you're shooting 4K, then you'll want something like 3840 by 2160. You'll find that the NLEs often have presets for these sizes, and if you've got some other wacky size, well, you should be able to set that manually. Frame rate. In this case, I'm setting 25 frames per second as the frame rate. You might want 50. You might want 30 if it's YouTube. Usually set the frame rate to match the footage from your camera. That's a good starting point. Now, how do we import the footage into our project? All NLEs have ways of importing footage, and it will all be pretty similar. In this case, you can see my video drive here on the left, and I can navigate from within the NLE, which in this case is DaVinci Resolve, straight to my footage. Now, I could just select the whole lot and drag it in, and that would be fine. But if you've got masses of shots and other bits and pieces like music, voiceover tracks, archive footage, and so on, it's all going to get mixed up together. Much better to create a new bin for each type of footage. A bin is simply a name for a folder within the NLE app, and you can call them anything you like. Here I can just drag and drop the files into the relevant bins. And by doing that, guess what? I've literally just imported my footage. It's that easy. On some other NLEs, it might be slightly different, but there will be a way to create bins and name them and put your footage inside them. So now the footage is imported, and next is the fun part. We can start to edit. But not before backing up your drive. Why not do it now and have a short break? I'm assuming here that you'll already have at least a basic knowledge of how your NLE works. But if you don't, there's plenty of YouTube channels out there that will help bring you up to speed. For the rest, stay with me and hopefully you'll pick up a snippet here or there. This is our timeline, all ready to go with nothing on it. You can either add tracks manually, or here in this case, if I drag a clip onto it, it automatically populates the timeline with what was recorded. In this case, the video and two tracks of audio. Track 1, which has a voice recorded on it, and track 2, which is the camera mic. I don't need the camera mic, so I just delete that here. So now, there's one video track and one audio track, because in a pinch, that's all you'll need. But once you want to add some extra sound like VO, that means voiceover, just like my voice you're hearing now, or say music or extra sound effects, anything like that, you can keep adding tracks easily. And just a word on audio tracks, make sure your audio is centered, that is not panned to the left or panned to the right. You want the same sound coming out of both speakers in a stereo configuration. Hopefully the audio you have recorded is in mono. That means dual mono, the same sound coming down both left and right side of the audio track. 
In some NLEs, it means making sure the audio track is panned to the center. This might seem a bit complicated for you right now, but don't worry too much. Google the difference between stereo and dual mono. You might also want to add extra video tracks, but we'll come to that in a while. First off, let's get some shots down onto the timeline. I've got my footage over here in their bins, all ready to go. I call them rushes because I'm a bit old-fashioned and that's what they're called in a lot of the world. In America, they're often called dailies and plenty of other things elsewhere. It's your camera footage and you can call it what you like. I've got my rushes here and I'm going to construct a short sequence of the good ship Golden Vanity sailing along the southern coast of England. You can see I've got shots from on board and I've also got some shots from a small dinghy motoring alongside as well. Now, I've only imported these few shots here to use in this example. In reality, there would be far more shots than you see here, and I would guess that some of you might struggle occasionally in remembering where everything is. Did you know that in professional TV and movie editing, it's actually someone's job to go through all the rushes from a shoot and log them, including information that describes what happens in the shot? Well, you can imagine, in a broadcast one-hour documentary with a shooting ratio of, say, 12 to 1, that's 12 hours of footage recorded for every one-hour broadcast, and that's quite normal, that's a lot of rushes to go through. I used to do that with film a few years ago. Well, maybe more than a few. You could find a method that's comfortable for you. Some NLEs let you do all the logging within the app, and you can keep it as simple as you like. Or maybe do what I did for a project a while back. I just write it all down. The time spent going through the rushes means you get to check it all out, and you can even give it star ratings for those magical moments. In fact, these logging sheets were for all the original footage shot for a film about Golden Vanity, so kind of useful here for me. I quite like having paper next to the computer because it gives my eyes somewhere else to look occasionally. So, as I said, over here on the left, we've got the rushes, and as you can see, I've got a lot of uh, footage to choose from. Let's find a nice little opening shot here. Uh, how about uh, a nice little pan up looking at the sails? So, I'm going to use this shot here, and so I select it in the uh, viewer, which is here, or the player in Old Money, and over here on the right is the canvas or the recorder. So, we're going to be editing from there to there and you'll see the shots again go onto the timeline to represent that. So I need to find a bit of this shot which uh, I like and there's a nice bit where it tilts up from the bowsprit of the boat to the mast and I'm going to use this little bit here and the way I do that is I find an in and an out point to select that bit of shot. So it's not what I'm cutting out, it's what I'm cutting in, the bits I want. And I do that by using the J, K, and L buttons on the keyboard. And if I press J, it goes backwards at one time speed. And K stops or pauses. And L goes forward at one time speed. That's why these NLE editors are often called J, K, L editors, because you use J, K, and L on the keyboard. And if I press it more than once, if I want to go backwards, I press the J key, and I press it again, and it goes backwards really quickly, as you can see. And even again, wow, there it goes. So let's find the bit of shot that I want, which is tilting up from the bowsprit. And to find the beginning of the shot, what I tend to do is I go backwards in real time. And you can see I'm going backwards because of this little component down here, which uh, represents the timeline of this shot. Okay. So instead of dragging it around and thinking, where am I going to start this shot? It's a bit arbitrary by uh, just starting it like that there. What I need to do is find where the shot starts. And I do this by going backwards in time. And one, two, three. Boom. Pause it there. And I'm going to mark that as an in point. And I use the letter I on the keyboard for in. And as you can see now, it's marked an in point. There's the end point. So I let the shot run by going to the in, pressing L on the keyboard or the space bar if you want, and it plays forwards. And we've got the mast, there's the top, looking for the end of the shot, which is boom, there, let it settle. 
and I can check that by going back and just reviewing that bit of shot. So there's the start of the shot. Gives your eye a chance to settle on what the shot is. Then we tilt up the mast to the top of the sails and there's the end of the shot. And that's fine. I can always trim it later. I can make it shorter or longer on once it's on the timeline. So first thing I'm going to do is drag the shot literally across onto the timeline. And as you can see, it's bringing the shot and two bits of soundtrack with it. Now, I happen to know that the sound recorded in the camera at the time was a uh, voice on track one, which I won't be using here because this is just shots of the boat. And the sync sound, and I'll explain sync in a moment, the sync sound is on track two. So I'll get rid of track one by highlighting it and then just deleting it. So I'll leave this uh, audio on track two for the moment. What is sync sound? Sync sound harks back to the days of film when film and the sound were recorded separately. The, the film was recorded in the camera and the sound was recorded on a tape machine, often called a nagra. And sound that was recorded at the same time as the camera is called sync sound because it's synchronized with the picture. So sync sound and sync picture go together and they're in synchronization. So if you hear me refer to sync sound, you'll know what it means. So I will uh, just drag that sync sound onto track one for now. OK, so we've got picture and we've got sound. And if I just go to the beginning of the shot and play it using the L key, JKL, remember? And you can see the timeline moves across the shot. And in the viewer on the right, the recorder or the canvas, you can see the shot play. So there's our first shot. I'm just going to make the timeline a bit smaller by pressing, in my case, Command on a Mac keyboard, Command minus. We haven't altered the length of the timeline. I'm just making it easier to view. If I make it nice and big like that, you can see when I press play, whoops, it's disappearing really, really quickly. Whereas if I make it really too small, then you can see that I don't have a lot of room to work there. So what we tend to do is just get it to the length of the viewing area of the timeline. So make it a bit smaller and I'm going to drag another shot down. So our first shot is there. Looking at the canvas or the recorder on the right, you can see the shot. And up it goes to the top. Whoops. Up it goes to the top there. And that's where we've got to. So we need another shot now. So off to the rushes again over here. And why don't we have something on board? And there's a nice shot here of this young lady who is handling the sails and then it pans to the left to show all the other crew by the mast. That's a nice bit of shot. So again, I've selected the uh, shot, so now it's in my viewer or player. And let's find the beginning of the shot, because it's a pan. I'm just going to go backwards. OK, I'm playing it forwards now, and you can see the uh, representation of where the uh, playhead is for the uh, shot there. So there's the end of the shot. Where's the beginning of the shot? So I'm going to go backwards in real time to find the beginning of the shot. OK, probably after she looks round. Oomph. Let's come in somewhere about there. And I mark that as my in using the I key. I play ahead in real time using the L key. So we're going forwards in time now. I'm looking for the end of the shot which is going to be somewhere around there. Mark that as the out. And we've got another shot to put down. Drag it down into the timeline with all its audio tracks. In fact, I don't have to bring all the audio tracks at once. What I can do is I can deselect the track I don't want over here using these red squares in DaVinci Resolve. If I deselect track one, it'll just bring down the video and audio track two. And I happen to know that audio track two as I mentioned before, is the camera microphone. So I drag that down and you can see what's happened. It's brought it down audio track two and plopped it there on the timeline track two. And I can put that wherever I like. I'll keep all the uh, sync sound together for the time being 
on audio track one just for simplicity so we now have two shots and you can see I've just butted them together so there's our first shot tilting up and here comes a cut to the second shot and you can see this young lady part of the crew is hauling on the sail and then we pan around to the rest of the crew and so there's our first two shots together now let's have a quick shot off the boat and we've got a couple of shots here I can look at I think this one's probably better so I'm going to just have a little look through the shot just dragging it along to find a steady bit it was very bouncy aboard this uh, rib which is a rigid inflatable boat and somewhere around here so I'm just going to uh, drag it to in the area in the ballpark and then press play and we're just looking at the uh, shot that's quite nice yeah that's nice so we'll let it end somewhere around there so I've marked the out this time before I've marked the in and I go backwards in real time and probably somewhere there just before it hits that big wave you can see it hits a big wave there boff like that boff there we go mark the in and I can now drag that shot down onto the timeline so now we've got three shots I put the audio up there to join the others and we've got a nice little timeline about uh, 27 seconds long so far so if I go back to the beginning of this section and just press play I can decide if I'm happy with it or if I want to alter the length of the shots there's the tilt up to the mast and it lingers quite a long time there so what I'm going to do is just go back and I'm going to mark a new out point for the shot and just trim it down a tiny bit and there's loads of ways to do this but this is a quick and simple way to do it and for this I go forwards in time and I'm looking for a new out point and I think it's going to be somewhere just after we finish the tilt up get to the top there and poof there's the new out point and you can see down here that we've got a little bit that we need to uh, delete and join the rest together so it makes a nice continuous movement so what I'm going to do here is do the same as I was doing up in the uh, player by marking an in and an out point and I do that literally down on the timeline by marking an in and an out and the out will be the end of the shot just here as you can see so if I mark that as the out we've now got a small slice of shot if you like which I don't want and what I want to do is butt these others up against this first shot so I'm taking something out and sliding them all together and the way I do that in DaVinci Resolve and FCPX I think is the same and several others is is shift delete if I just press delete you'll see what happens it removes that slice that section of shot but doesn't butt these up against this so I'll just pop that back to where we were I've got this section ready to go and I hit shift delete this time and you can see what's happened it's deleted that part of the shot and move the others up to take up the space so now if we play the shot you can see on the right there the end of the shot comes and we're into the next shot so that's a quick way to trim a shot let's say I want to extend a shot how do you go about doing that well again there's loads and loads of ways uh, a very quick and simple way here and especially so you can see what's happening on the timeline is let's say I want to extend the next shot and just give it a tad longer so we can see what's going on with the crew on the deck there before we come to the external shot of Golden Vanity and what I'm going to do is just highlight Golden Vanity and her audio and then drag them over to the right just to give myself some space and then I'm going to uh, take the end of the shot and you can see the cursor changes into uh, several different types of uh, representations as I move it uh, across the end of the shot there and what I'm looking for is this one because that's going to basically take the end of the shot and it shows me with the white perimeter to the right the actual length of the shot that's as far as I can go so if I want I can drag the shot all the way over to there that's the maximum that's the end of the shot so that's where it was that's the maximum we need to find out where I want to extend the shot to so what I'm going to do is just extend it to its maximum press play yeah, one more. 
and see where I want the shot to finish. How about just as that guy bends down to uh, tend to one of the ropes. So he's hauling up on it, there are two of them holding, and he turns down and poof. So that's where I want to uh, join the shot. I'm going to extend the sound so it reaches the same point, which is there. And I can either drag that back to match and drag that over to there, and then it's complete. Or what I can do instead is, that's where we were, I can mark an in and an out. In, out, and then shift delete does it all automatically. And there's many other ways to uh, trim a shot as well. A bit more advanced, so we'll leave that for another day. But there's a very, very basic way of getting a few shots down and trimming to suit. So there's our timeline populated with some shots. The video in this case is the blue stripe and the audio is green. Don't worry if the colors differ or the way things group together don't look like this on your NLE. If you're using FCPX, you're a special type of person anyway. We could call this a sequence even. You might want to save it as a separate timeline and call it sequence one. Or you might want to edit the whole show onto the one timeline. It's entirely up to you. So now I want to put some VO in. And that's the voice of the enthusiastic Mr. Tom Cunliffe, who was sailing aboard Golden Vanity for the day. In fact, here we have Tom talking to the camera and we call this a PTC, or piece to camera. There you go, all you bloggers out there talking into your cameras. You've all been doing glorified PTC, or pisties, all this time. So for now, I'm just going to clip up a short piece of Tom's voice only and pop it down here onto the timeline. But where? Traditionally, I've always put VO, or PTC sound, on track one, because it's kind of important stuff. So what I'll do is move all the sync sound onto track two and pop Tom onto track one. Let's have a quick listen. Yep, it sounds like crap. Well, that's because we're hearing both Tom and the sync sound of the video shots at the same sound level. It's worth explaining very quickly here the difference between gain and volume. Basically, volume is what you hear with your ears. If it's too loud, you turn the volume down. So gain is effectively input, and volume is effectively output. It's absolutely fine to change and tweak the gain now, or in the audio mixing later. So, to make this sound better for now, I'm going to reduce the level on the sync sound so we can hear Tom's voice. And here I do that by simply dragging the rubber band down and you can see the level reduces. The term rubber banding or rubber bands is pretty common to most NLEs, so you'll probably come across it. It's the thin line here showing the audio level. It looks like a rubber band. Well, it did to someone at some stage. The sea's sparkling, we've got force four to five wind, and she's healing sweetly. There we go, now we can hear Tom talking away nicely. Next up, I've got a bit of music I want to use. So where to put that? Well, we can make extra tracks, uh, so we can put it anywhere we like. I'll put it on track three. Why not? Lovely. The sea's sparkling, we've got force four to five wind, and she's healing sweetly. And now we have the same issue we had earlier with Tom's voice. So for now, I'm just going to drag the level on the music down a bit so we can continue to hear Tom like this. Sparkling, we've got force four to five wind. OK, it's not perfect, but it will do fine until we come to finish off the sound, or as they say, do a sound mix. Right, now I want to include a title caption and put it over the top of the shot of Golden Vanity sailing along. All NLEs will have a method of adding text over a shot. Here I simply drag in a preset text shot, and this is where I'm going to put it onto a freshly made video track 2. So I pop it on there and just drag the length to about right. And then if I open the properties dialog of that text shot, 
I can change the text and make it say Golden Vanity. Let's give it a nice benign font and I use Arial as my go-to for that. Adjust the size and although in the past the use of drop shadow was almost mandatory, these days the fashion seems to be plain. That said, if you try and put white text over a light background, it can be a little tricky to read. My advice? Make things as easy for the viewer as possible. If they struggle to see some text, they'll be spending time thinking about that and not what's happening in the video. Go with your gut reaction. If it looks right, it is right. If not, add drop shadow and tweak to taste. So there's the title on Video Track 2. And as you can see, Video Track 2 takes precedence over Video Track 1. If I change things around like this, you can see the title disappears because now it's underneath the shot of Golden Vanity. So the hierarchy of the video tracks is track one is underneath everything above it. And the shot or item on the highest video track takes precedence. Unlike the audio tracks where they all blare out at the same time, unless you rein them in. In fact, you can do quite a lot of interesting things with multiple video tracks, but, well, that's for another time. The last thing here to show you is that all these shots are cut together. That is, the transition from one shot to the next is by a hard cut. We might want to put in something else, like maybe a simple dissolve. In the old days on film, we used to call this a mix, because one shot mixes through to another shot but Dissolve describes it just as well. Most NLEs give you about one zillion different transitions, and I'm not going to go into them here. You can tinker away with all your stars and wipe transitions and so on. Please, just don't bring them near me. I'll just alter the length of this Dissolve. I tend to use either 8 frames or 12 frames or maybe 25 frames. So 25 frames, that's one second on a 25 frames per second timeline. So, there we have our simple little sequence, and next we'll look at tidying that sound up. At this stage, you can lock the picture track if you like. This prevents inadvertently messing things up by maybe the cat walking across the keyboard. And one last thing, time to do a backup of your drive before the next step. Here in DaVinci Resolve, we're blessed with a whole bunch of different types of timeline presentations. And this one is specifically for the audio. Don't worry if your NLE is a bit more basic. They all do the same thing and finalize the audio so it sits within specified parameters. And you can smooth it all out so it sounds great. And more to the point, once you put it on YouTube, everyone who watches the video will think it sounds great as well. The last thing you need is audio to be too low or too high. So, and excuse me for a minute, but we're going to get a tiny bit technical about sound levels. We all know that we can go into the yellow a little bit and hardly ever the red, right? But who decides what level the yellow and the red are set at? Good question. First, make sure your audio meters are set to DBFS. That means decibel, full scale, more commonly referred to now as just dB. And that's different from the old VU meters that you might have seen years ago on a disc jockey's desk. With dB levels, the levels are different depending on where you watch the video. For broadcast, we typically peak at about minus 12 or neg 12 dB. But for YouTube, the general consensus is to peak about neg 6 dB. Absolute maximum. You don't want to have your meters hitting 0 dB or anywhere near. In the old days, you used to hit 0 dB on a VU meter, but not here. And that's fine, as most NLEs seem to have the red portion of the meter set to about neg 10 dB. So for broadcast, we tend to just hit the yellow and never the red. But what it all boils down to for you, publishing on YouTube, if you aim to just occasionally hit the red on the highest sounds you've got in the edit, well, you won't be far wrong. 
So then it's just a simple case of smoothing out the audio and making sure it doesn't go too high and that you can hear everything you need to, right? And how you do that is entirely up to you. You can drag the rubber bands around, you can have the audio across as many tracks as you like, but I suspect you'll want to keep it simple, so we'll go with that. In our example edit, all the sync sound that was recorded by the camera is all butted up against each other when we cut those shots together, right? Sure, but what if some of the audio was louder than the other bits? You can get a hard audio hit as the shot changes. Nasty. All you need to do is pop an audio transition onto where the two pieces of sound join each other. Say, a one second audio dissolve. So let's check through by listening to just the sync sound. We'll turn off the other audio tracks so we can't hear them. Now that sounds a whole lot better. Now let's get the levels sorted out for the sync sound, Tom's voice, and the music. There's several ways to do this, and it just needs a bit of practice to find out what's comfortable for you. You can drag the levels manually, you can fade the sound in and out using transitions, or you could do it the old fashioned way like me and manually mix the sound using the faders. You can do that by dragging the fader as the film plays. So, watch the green rubber band levels. They turn red, in this case, when I'm overriding the existing level and setting a new one. Literally, on the fly, in real time. Because that's how we watch things, isn't it? In real time. Or even better, invest in something like this, a PreSonus fader port. A nifty piece of hardware that has a motorized fader that gives you a bit more tactile feel to things. So have a listen as I do this. It's absolutely lovely. The sea's sparkling, we've got force four to five wind, and she's healing sweetly. It's absolutely lovely. The sea's sparkling, we've got force four to five wind, and she's healing sweetly. Hey, that sounds pretty cool. Yep, happy with that. Now I can go ahead and lock all the audio tracks, just in case the cat's about. So not much left to do, really. In fact, you could just finish here and now. But hey, you like things to look good as well, right? Let's have a quick look at the shots and see if any need a little tweak. Believe it or not, there is a whole side industry in colour grading. There are people whose full-time job is to take your documentary or feature film and spend hours and hours every day adjusting the visual presentation of the film. They can make a shot lighter or darker, add or subtract colour and tone, all to suit the mood of the film according to the director. And a lot of them use DaVinci Resolve just for that although other NLEs work nicely too. So let's have a quick look at a very complicated Resolve color page. Now, before you run away screaming and shaking, I'm just going to show you the very basics and how you can enhance some of the video you've shot. Any colorists watching this, please look away now. Here's the first shot I'm going to adjust. As you can see, it's a bit flat. So I'm going to look at the scopes here, off to the right, they show me a representation of the shot purely in terms of light and dark values, split into three parts, R, G and B, red, green and blue. All computer displays and TVs use RGB as the basic building blocks of how you see colour on them. Just the exact opposite to printed colour, which is CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow and black. On the left here, I've got some wheels, which are kind of fun. And if I take the far left wheel, called Lift, that will adjust the shadows. So if I drag it down in value, you'll see the scope on the right reflecting that move and bring the values to where they should be. 
and if you look at the shot above it already starts to look more promising. Next I'll adjust the game wheel which takes care of the highlights, all the light parts of the shot. You often hear of the highlights being blown out and this is what blown out looks like. See how the scope on the right shows all the lightest parts crushed together at the top. So we need to bring that down and set it somewhere about there. Next we can have a tweak of the midtones by adjusting the gamma wheel and you can see right away what that's doing. Well, I don't know about you but that already looks way better than before. So that's effectively adjusting the shot for contrast. But what about this shot here? There's clearly an issue with the color balance with it. Maybe you've shot something in daylight and had a manual white balance set incorrectly. Whatever the reason, it don't look right. The good news is it's easy to correct. But before you do, maybe Google RGB color and spend a few minutes learning about color and how red, green and blue work. For instance, this shot is far too blue, so what we need to do is reduce the amount of blue in it and add a bit of red and green to make it look better. A bit like this. You see how I'm clicking and dragging on the centers of the wheels and moving the cursor away from the blue. And you can see the result both in the scopes on the right and in the image above. Some call it voodoo but I like to call it a bit of magic. That's looking great. And here's a quick tip. You want to make a shot black and white? Just dial down the saturation to zero. And hey presto, we've suddenly gone back in time. You don't have to grade each and every shot individually. For instance, if there's a range of shots that need the same tweak, you can copy the grade to all of them at once and all the NLEs will have a method of doing exactly that. And so that's picture grading for now. Don't forget to back up the drive. So finally we've come to the stage where we want to output a final video file, the finished film, ready for viewing. The first thing I would say is that it makes a lot of sense to export a master full resolution version of your film so you've got a version of the highest quality. You can then keep this as a failsafe. It will always be there for you to make YouTube versions from, smaller versions for sending to people, whatever. And the next time you open your NLE and it crashes on you, you've still got the master file all ready to go. You can export a master file in any format you like because that's not going anywhere. It's staying with you somewhere safe. If you'd like a starting point, I'd recommend saving it as a QuickTime movie. And even better, as an Apple ProRes file, if you can. Don't worry if you're working on a PC. ProRes files are universal and work on any platform. There's different flavors of ProRes and they all take up different amounts of space on your drive. And that might be an issue for you. For the best quality versus file size, just go ahead and use ProRes 422. If you're tight for space, use ProRes 422LT. Google Apple ProRes and you'll see a full list of the types of ProRes file types. Don't be scared of the 422 part. That just refers to the color space. Google 422 color space. If you're shooting in 4444, then I'd like to sign on to your project, please. So now you've exported your master file. Keep it safe. And what do you do next? Well, there's a few ways you can go to get that film onto somewhere like YouTube. But before you do, just a word on how YouTube handles whatever you upload to it. You can create the best resolution movie in the world, spend hours uploading it, and good old YouTube will happily crunch it down using its own compression methods. That's not really a bad thing at all, but knowing this could save you a bit of time in case you're thinking of uploading your 24 gigabyte master movie file. So what are we going to do with our film? All the NLEs will let you export straight from the app as a compressed MP4 file, and a lot of them have presets to help you, so it's kind of a no-brainer to use them. At the end of the day, if you export using a YouTube setting like here, 
Then, once uploaded and processed by YouTube, have a look, and if you're happy, job done. What do I do? Well, I take my master file and I bring it into Apple's Compressor app, and I do it manually. I've got some presets over on the left here, and I found that crunching the master movie down into a 10 megabit multipass MP4 file suits YouTube just fine. As you can see, I tend to work in HD, and that suits me for now. But if you're using 4K, then just make sure you're crunching the 4K numbers. Although there's nothing to stop you mastering in 4K and creating an HD version, or even smaller. Sometimes when I'm working on a film and I need to send an interim edit to the producer, then I'll send a really small version to them so they can hear and see the film enough to make a judgment depending on what's been updated. The benefit is that a smaller file can be sent literally in an email. Or you could just export the audio if it's relevant, or even just the video. The nice thing about Compressor and this type of app is that you've got a way to keep things organized the way you want them without an NLE deciding things for you. But most NLEs have a way to adjust the settings as well, so it's purely a matter of choice and what works for you. And that's really about it. I hope this film has been informative, or at the very least given you some food for thought. Getting out there and creating your content is so much fun. So when you can make a living doing something you love, well, that's pretty much nirvana. If you've got any questions, please do leave them in the comments and I'll do my best. I'll be doing some more in-depth videos about editing soon. If you've enjoyed this video, please, please, please do remember to hit the like button. And why not subscribe? And finally, don't forget to back up that drive. Thanks for watching. <laughs>